and welcome to Read the World. My name is Derek Main, and I review translated literature. It's a pretty weird day to review translated literature. A pretty weird time to review translated literature. It kind of always feels selfish in the sense that I just want to discuss the books I love. Of course it feels niche. You know, it is. Selfish in that it's for me. You know, I mean, I love it when, when people watch. That's that's the whole idea. I love it when conversations are started. Uh, I love to be able to lift up any sort of translated literature and to be a part of the community. And it means an awful lot to me. Um, but it's weird to do it in the midst of the country I live in, America is um, on fire across across the entire country due to another um, continuous showing of police brutality towards people of color uh, now towards protesters um, and essentially uh, martial law sort of in the streets that is perpetuated by encouraged um, by a, a president who tear gasses peaceful protesters in order to have a photo op to hold up a book that he has never read in front of a church that does not welcome him. It was a violent time. People are losing their lives. People are going to jail. Uh, this week I've been giving money to um, bail bond causes throughout the cities that are having protest um, so we can get those that are uprising out of jail so they can more quickly get back in the streets or take their time to heal whatever it is they need. Um, long rambling introduction because it feels weird to talk about literature, but that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to stop that other part because the literature that I'm going to talk about today, um, it was written by someone that cared deeply about these kinds of issues. I mean, cared deeply about political issues and justice and how we treat each other. And I still think literature matters. I still think there's a place for it. Do I think it's the most important thing in the world? No, it's an entertainment. But it's an entertainment not, with, not without its value philosophically, ethically, morally. Okay? All right. So how did this start, this particular review? Because today I'm gonna to review The Third Reich by Roberto Bolano, which I've read, this is my third time reading it, and then By Night in Chile by Roberto Bolano. Um, second or third time reading that. So why two books and what's the deal? Well, this is gonna be a different format. And the situation is, I saw on Twitter a few weeks ago, uh, Damien Keller, one of my favorite readers and an excellent writer from Australia, was going back and forth with some folks on some of Bolano's minor works, you know, some of his smaller novels. Roberto Bolano is probably the most, uh, or the sexiest name, at least, in translated literature in the past 20 years. Uh, they keep unearthing new works of his. I think another one comes out next year, uh, magically, despite um, his death. <laughs> Uh, and it is compiling sort of a complicated work, a complicated life to sort of study. You know, we have an unabashed masterpiece in 2666 that was unfinished, but is, is a masterpiece nonetheless. Um, and we have The Savage Detectives, which is now sort of acting as an entry point for people. Um, it's an excellent book. It's a lot of fun. In many ways, the most fun of his books to read. And he is not necessarily a fun writer. He's quite dark. But The Savage Detectives, a fun romp, especially for anyone who spent any time in artistic endeavors and doing a bunch of drugs and drinking and sleeping around and living that kind of bohemian lifestyle at any point in their life. Okay? And it's certainly about more than that, but that's the entry point of fun. Uh, the Savage Detective's place in his work, again, I think sort of acts as that entry point. So we've got the one masterpiece, 2666, and another one, in fact, I think in The Distant Star, which is a novella. Um, when we are discussing 
evil, uh, that work I think fits in quite well and is, I am comfortable saying, another masterpiece. Where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us then with a lot of other novellas. Um, many people love Nazi literature in the Americas. It's actually one of my least favorites of his works. Um, Antwerp, I do not like at all. Um, it is a more poetry than prose, and I think they are prose poems. Um, Amulet, I think is not good. Uh, I have a fondness for the skating ring quite a lot. I like the story, but um, you know, it is fairly simple. A little lump in novella, not that great, um, honestly, fun little read. And so anyway, I won't go through everything, but By Night in Chile by Roberto Bolano has started to kind of creep up in the critical discourse as being perhaps next to 2666, his finest work, which I find very surprising and we'll get into. It's a good work, but I think it is a minor work. Now, let's contrast that with The Third Reich. The Third Reich by Roberto Bolano is considered a minor work, almost universally. And yet, I think it is his third or perhaps fourth most important work, and I think there are elements in The Third Reich that do not exist in any of his other work, therefore making it kind of one of the most fun to read for sure, but also one of the most rich to study as a text. And so I'm going to get into that as I compare these two very different books in how they are seen sort of culturally amongst Roberto Bolano fans, and then, and then how I may have a different view of that. So let's start with By Night in Chile, which is a very sort of simple story. We have a priest that is on his deathbed, and I, I mean, I, I think it's, I, I think it's sort of not completely accurate to say that he is giving his deathbed confession, but he is certainly recounting his life, you know. This review is for people who have read both books, so there will be Spoilers throughout. Even if you knew everything that happened, uh, the beauty of Bolano is in the writing. It is in the atmospheric mood that he is going to encapsulate in his writing and that you're going to feel as you sit there. So still worth reading, but this is these two reviews, unlike my normal ones, are going to, or this comparison, unlike my normal reviews, is going to give away what the story is, okay? So... He is the priest going to go to Farewell's house, the most prestigious literary critic in all of Chile, and sort of join in on that group. And the priest is going to begin to do his own criticism and write his own poems, okay? And the first time that he goes there, Pablo Narado, the poet, captivates the priest, and he is one of Farewell's finest friends. Now, Bolano himself spoke very negatively about Narada. Narada won a Nobel Peace Prize, but Narada was a communist. And in today's sort of Chapo Trap House language, I think we'd call him a tanky or something like that. Um, I, I, this is what he, Bolano, said about Narada, who also was a politician as well, I should say, Narada was, um, from a 2000, an interview in 2000. I never liked Narada. Anyone who was capable of writing odes to Stalin while shutting his eyes to the Stalinist terror doesn't deserve my respect. So, Narada is a communist. Uh, Bolano is a member of the left. But here we have a schism that exists even today within the left. Okay, And it's a very important one because um, authoritarianism thrives in the left just as easily it does in the right. The next sort of stage of action that kind of comes in is these import-export guys. These are really shady characters. They come in and they want uh, our priests to do, perform some action. But he ends up um, traveling all across Europe on behalf of these import-export agents to catalog churches in decay. And, and, and so they're, they're, his work is to understand what it is about churches in this time uh, that, that they're not thriving, okay? Now, political unrest begins in Chile. And he returns home. The political unrest is Allende is elected president. Now, 
The priest, along with Farewell, is just, they are torn apart at this, okay? All right, so what the priest does during Alande's time as president is he, to ignore this unrest, he buries himself into the classics, okay? And then there is a coup, and Alande kills himself, and the priest, along with Farewell, his uh, literary critic hero, declare that there is peace at last now that Alande's dead. All right, so now the shady import-export guys, they come back, and they sort of bully, give the priest no real option, but force him into um, teaching Marxism to General Pinochet and his little underlings and other generals so that Pinochet can better understand the left to defeat it. Story that, That's really the gist of the, of the story, okay? The writing is very good. Here are some issues with it. It moves along at such a... A, B, C, D, E plot pace that it's not mysterious. It doesn't have that tenor of other Bolano work, which we'll get to in a minute with the Third Reich, of terror underneath. This is much more a bureaucratic sort of look at the changing of the guard a few different times in Chilean politics and how one priest sees it through his life. Um, Alinde is uh, a source of, of great pain to the priest and unrest, whereas the Christian Democrats, whom I believe the priest would call himself, and excuse me for my very bare-bones understanding of the historic history of something as complicated as Chilean politics, but um, I believe he would call himself a Christian Democrat, so this is sort of another faction. But then, of course, we have Pinochet, the far, far right, and a dict dictator in his own right, that he, the priest, is willing to help. Even though it starts off as bullying, he's quite taken in many ways, I think, with Pinochet, and is certainly proud of the fact that he is going to get to do this work. Okay. Blah, la, 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 la. What does all this mean? It means that this is a personal work by Roberto Bolano dealing with nuance and intricacies within the Chilean political era of his time as he saw it. Bolano actually came back to Chile most of his life. He didn't live there. He came back to Chile and he was arrested during the, during the um, eventual coup that would that would take out Alande's government. So he was a supporter of that government. Um, so he has a stake here, and this should be read as a political text. And by that I mean, I think you need a lot of other nonfiction and first-person account source material to really understand what it is is doing as a writer, because the story itself is really just window dressing for what he's trying to do. Okay. That to me makes it an interesting work, a good work, but as far as literary, it doesn't have it for me because that's not the purpose of the thing. Let's move to the Third Reich. You hear the title of the Third Reich, and you immediately think, oh, this is going to be super political. And it's Bolano, so sure it is. But really, the heart and the meat of this story is about unspoken terror, and you as a reader just gripped at the edge of your seat what's going to happen next. The plot line is so bananas, it is going to be difficult for me to try it to summarize it, but I'll try. A German couple, and, and let's start with Udo. Udo is our main character. Udo and his girlfriend Ingborg are going to vacation in Spain at a small little hotel that Udo, when he was a child, 10 years ago, so he's now 25 and he's thinking back to when he was like seven to 15, used to vacation at. He's taking Ingborg here. Udo is a German champion of a war board game called the Third Reich. 
it's not his job. He works at, I believe, a telephone company or something, but he spends all of his time and his energy and he is uh, writes articles and he goes to competitions and his whole mental facilities are all based on this board game, The Third Reich, where he plays as Germany and tries to um, recreate World War II and win as Germany. Now, side note, does this mean that he is a Nazi? Well, that kind of comes up throughout, but I think ultimately does not matter. It is the game that he is in love with, okay? It is the moves and the strategy and the thinking and the different sort of variants, a very complicated sort of game of chess. That's what he's in love with. They go on vacation. Ingborg wants to be at the beach. Udo wants to be in his hotel room playing this game. There's a couple other aspects. Frau. Frau is a woman, owner of the hotel. She's the wife who Udo was in love with when he was a child. Frau is about 10 years older. So now she'd be 35. When he was 15, she was 25. So he's kind of chasing her around the hotel. She does not remember him. Okay. And Udo's presence, he's a creep. So he's bothering Frau. He is bothering the maid. He is bothering the uh, receptionist because he needs a bigger table for his war game and he's just a creep. He makes your skin kind of crawl. All right, Udo and Ingborg immediately, upon arriving at the next door hotel, find another German couple, Charlie and Hannah. Charlie is a drunk, a louse, and he wants to get into the real Spain. So he meets the wolf and the lamb. And the wolf and the lamb are these elements, these types of people who feed off of the tourist season and, um, and, and they show you a wonderful time in the real Spain, but there is a danger inherent in their presence, okay? So, Hannah and Ingborg, Charlie and Udo are now a foursome, and the wolf and the lamb now come along. There's another very, very important character, which is, right in front of these two hotels, there is a, a, a mass castle of pedal boats, and the owner of this pedal boat operation is a scarred man, okay? Um, and this scarred, muscle-bound man um, has built a fortress of pedal boats that he lives underneath at night when he is not, during the day, out renting them. He is very mysterious, he unner unnerves people, and Udo is immediately sort of enraptured with him, okay? Another character. Lots of events happen. We go to lots of clubs. There's lots of hints of danger. There's violence with Charlie hitting Hannah. There is um, Ingborg and Udo's relationship sort of teetering on the brink because they're quite, quite different people. There is the um, illicit sort of affair happening between Udo and Frau at the same time. Frau has a husband, the other owner of the hotel, who is sick with cancer. He is bedridden. Okay? And he is another element of the story, another piece of this constellation that is encircling Udo. And let's stop, pause. You cannot describe this work. You cannot summarize this work. Udo is eventually going to play the game, the Third Reich, with the scarred man, the pedal boat operator. And slowly, everything in Udo's world is going to fall to pieces. Charlie will die in a windsurfing accident drunk. Hannah will return to Germany. Ingborg will return to Germany at the date she was supposed to. Udo will stay. The wolf and the lamb kind of stalk Udo a bit. What is he doing there? Everyone at the hotel wants Udo to leave. Udo does not leave. Udo's sole purpose now is in beating this scarred man, the pedal boat operator, in a game of the Third Reich. At the same time, trying to bed Frau. What's happening is the husband of Frau is meeting the pedal boat operator, Udo thinks. At night, 
to give him secrets to beat Udo in this game. So the husband is going into Udo's room when he's not there and he's looking at all of his articles and his photocopies and the shape of the board and then he's going and helping this man. Eventually Udo will lose this game. He will lose this game slowly. As he loses this game, he slowly loses his mind. He loses his friends. He loses his relationship. This is the genesis of the story. There is so, so much there, though. And it ends unsatisfactorily, I would like to add. This is not a perfect work. We are not discussing the Third Reich because it belongs in the same conversation as Distant Star 2666. The ending of the Third Reich is wrapped up so neatly, and Udo immediately goes back to a bourgeois Germany lifestyle that is entirely bereft of all of the pain and terror that he just went through. In fact, in about seven pages, it's just like we revert all the way back right to normal. And it's odd. But what's important about the Third Reich and what's so different is that it is a game within a game about a game. And the entirety of that game is symbolic of World War II, defining aspect of the 20th century, played by a German in Spain against a Latin American man of unknown country origin, the backdrop of a vacation gone totally awry. There's more here than you can get into in a 15, 30, whatever minute video. But it's the kind of entertainment as far as literature goes that invites you to keep coming back to it and trying to understand what it was that Bolano wanted to get at. Because this was found within his papers after he died. This was not published while he was alive. This is seeing one of the most important writers of the 21st century working through something. And I like that. This, by Night in Chile, is a complete work. It's totally and entirely self-contained, but it's a personal political work. It requires, as I said, a lot of other material and knowledge to really understand. And it is a bit of a time capsule, okay? It's a bit frozen in that era of Chilean politics. The Third Reich is something else. He was getting at something much, much more interesting in terms of human nature in the 20th century. Um, and we don't know quite what that was because it, it does not feel fully fleshed out. Not because it wasn't finished, because I believe it was. It doesn't feel fully fleshed out because it feels like Bolano in many of these works that are considered minor works is working and building towards something, okay? Except, and this is my final thought on the matter, in many of the works you can see him building up to either the Savage Detectives or 2666, depending on which work you're reading. Okay, uh, The Spirit of Science Fiction, that was one of the, another one that came out, I don't know, last year, whatever, that was found. A work I didn't like at all. But, but you see the characters are sort of similar here to Savage Detectives, we're building up to that. Distant Star, clearly this is elements here of 2666. The Third Reich, you find it in neither work, okay? So it's something else that wanted to be expressed, and since we lost this writer so young, it is endlessly fascinating to me to think about what that expression was meant to be. I want to dive into the things that are incomplete, the things that are not there yet, the things that have not been fully fleshed out, the things that have not been worked out, and we're not even sure if the author has figured it out, but there is something there because what that is to me is a passing of the baton to say, here, I felt this. Can someone make something of it? 
solidarity with all those protesting throughout this country and throughout this world against police brutality. Stay safe out there. Be good to folks.